So if you want to turn in your Bibles there to Matthew chapter 4, and the context here is that Jesus was just baptized in the Jordan River by John in obedience to the command of the Father. And the Spirit of God descended upon him like a dove. And perhaps you're wondering, as we go into Matthew chapter 4, if you're familiar with what we're getting ready to read, you're thinking, is he going to preach the same message that he preached just a few months ago when he preached about the temptations of Jesus? And we had three sermons on it, right? Three Sunday, successive Sundays about the temptation of Christ. What, what are we going to do now? Well, we are going to, with God's help, try to cover all 11 of these verses, the entirety of this section tonight, and um, I want to look at it through a bit of a different lens than we did um, back in June when we preached this uh, from a sister passage in Luke's Gospel. So if you want to read along with me, Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse 1, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Back in June when we went through Jesus' temptations, and that series was called Tested in the Wilderness, Recall that when we looked at these, we dove down and we saw that Jesus was thoroughly tested to the breaking point with these temptations. He did not break, but he was tested to that extremity to reveal his perfect righteousness. I mean, to just put on display, tested as you will in every way, and what was revealed was his perfect, impeccable righteousness. And this was found not only in the extremity of the specific temptations, but in all the categories of temptation we see here. Because Jesus was tested in three ways. And I believe there's a tie back to the Garden of Eden, where Eve was tempted to eat the fruit, and she saw that it was um, pleasant to the eyes, it looked like it was going to taste good, and it was fruit to be desired to make one wise. So three categories, if you will, of temptation, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, as it's described elsewhere in Scripture. And again, by way of review, in this first temptation, when Jesus was tempted to turn the stones into bread, this was the lust of the flesh. He was hungry. He had been driven into the wilderness by the Spirit of God, which had just come down upon him, led by God's Spirit to go into the wilderness, led by God's Spirit to fast, and was staying there because that's what God wanted. Satan came in, tempting Jesus to go beyond God's provision and plan to satisfy his desires. And this was the most basic of desires, to eat, to have enough food. He was starving to death. But he would not go beyond God's provision. He would not go beyond God's plan. Number two was when Satan took him up, um, in this, in Matthew's gospel here, to the top of the temple, telling him to cast himself off. 
and thus demonstrate that he was God's son because the angels would take care of him. This was, I believe, the category of the pride of life. Because such a display would be very public. People would see that. People, it's what the people expected of the Messiah. And we know that Jesus desired to be known by men as to who he was, but he was only revealed in that way to those whom the Father revealed it to. Those were the ones who truly knew him. And so the temptation here was for Jesus, the tempted to become the, or excuse me, the tested to become the tester, for the servant to become the sovereign. He would not force God's hand like that. He would stay in submission to his father. But he was tested at this point where he desired men to know who he was. And then finally, the lust of the eye, this third temptation where he was offered all the kingdoms of the world. We know that Jesus desired the hearts of men. He has been promised a day when every knee will bow, every tongue will confess to the glory of the Father that Jesus is the Lord. He desires that. He looks toward that. Satan's temptation was to take this shortcut to achieve the desire of his heart in exchange for counterfeit worship. And Jesus would not take this shortcut, this sham, even though it was something he ultimately desired. And so we see those three temptations of Christ. And I, I want to talk about a couple things tonight. I want to look at this and I want to ask you, is this a trial, a test, or a temptation? The first thing I want to talk about tonight is, is this a trial, is this a test, or is this a temptation? And the answer to that is yes. Yes. And I want to think for a moment, and I want to kind of establish some of these categories in our mind to help us as we read Scripture to understand Scripture a little more clearly. In the book of James, chapter 1, if you were to go there and read in your Bibles, and I, I encourage you to go look at these, these verses, James chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, um, it becomes confusing um, when you read this um, because it looks like it's saying two or three things with the same word. In the King James, it says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted of God, for, not, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. The challenge in this passage is that the Greek word for trial... And the Greek word for temptation are the same. And the one to translate it into, the one to understand it as, is based upon the context of it. But this passage speaks really about three different things. It speaks about trials. It speaks about being tested. And it speaks about being tempted. And you could truly have all three of these things woven into one. What is a trial? What is a trial? A trial is any burden or difficulty we have to go through for a season. That's what a trial is. It is a difficulty that you have to experience. And from your perspective, and this is from you, when you have a difficulty in your life, it is a trial. Amen? Amen? That's a trial. But what about a test? What's a test? Well, we see that uh, in this passage here in James, it talks about when one has stood the trial or has been tried, which means the test. It's speaking about going through a trial, but then in the midst of a trial, you may be tested. Being tested is God's perspective and purpose in the midst of a trial. So you are going through, from your perspective, a difficulty. You are going and enduring, or you're enduring through a burden for a season of time. And I say season because we know as Christians, it's not going to last forever. Right? We've got glory, we've got hope ahead of us. But for a span of time, for seasons, we are enduring a trial. And God behind that trial may be testing us. That's God's perspective. That's something that God does. We're not to be the testers, right? Jesus said, you know, we're not supposed to test. That's God's to test. 
We're not to test God. God tests us. And he does this. Why? Because by testing us, he wants to prove our faith. In 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7, it says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The Lord may allow you to endure a trial because He's trying to test you to reveal where you really are. And oftentimes with us, He wants to show forth that there's something real in us. We got this treasure in the earthen vessels and we're subjected to pressures and difficulties so that the world might see that there's something greater is He that's in me than he that's in the world. And so it's to show forth what he's doing inside you. And so that's God's perspective and God's purpose. Remember Joseph as he spoke about the great trial of his brother selling him into slavery. He says, you meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. Right? Well, what about temptation? What about temptation? Temptation is when Satan will jump into a trial or test, he can do it in other ways too, but jumps into a trial or test with the purpose of tempting you to do evil, to harm you, to hurt you, because he hates you, okay? And so Satan can jump in the midst of this trial where God is testing you, and he will come in and try to jump into that and pull you to evil. That's his perspective, and that's his purpose. An example that crossed my mind is uh, the first uh, Pauline missionary journey, uh, journey when Paul and Barnabas took off and they had with them some others as well, one of whom was John Mark. And all of those brethren on that missionary journey, when they started off, they faced together the same trials. They faced the same trials as they were, went off on the ship and started preaching in those places. No doubt in some way God was testing them to demonstrate the quality of their character. But Satan went on that first missionary voyage with them, right? And he was tempting. And no doubt he probably tempted all of them, but he was definitely tempting John Mark to discouragement and to give up. And John Mark, under the same trials, the same test, demonstrated and fell to Satan. He demonstrated that he was not possessing the maturity yet that he later would grow to possess. And he abandoned them and took off back home. So Satan can jump into any trial, any test, and create temptation in the midst of it because that's his purpose and perspective. So for Christ, here in Matthew 4, this was a trial. This was hard. It was absolutely hard. And it was a test because the Lord was trying to demonstrate Jesus' righteousness and obedience to bring that to full maturity and fruition. And Satan was jumping on here at the end trying to take advantage of Jesus. And this, my friends, was temptation of the highest order. Temptation of the highest order. This was Satan, not a lesser demon. He didn't pass this one off to one of the others. Satan took this one himself. And he came to Jesus when he was at his weakest. When he was at his weakest. My friends, one of the best things that we can do for one another is to recognize when we are weak, when we are weakened by things, when others are going through difficulty and pray, uh, uh, pray a hedge of protection about them from the enemy because Satan will try to exploit us in our weakness. And here Satan comes to Jesus when he is starving to death. And he comes and he hits him where it hurts. We spent a lot of time a few weeks ago explaining that Satan came to Jesus and poked at him and prodded him in the very things that were the desire of his heart. Each temptation was extreme and it fully tested him. And what we see 
in this passage that I want to spend the rest of our time talking about is a master class in spiritual warfare. This right here is the most completely revealed, opened up example of spiritual warfare in the Scripture. And it is taught by none other than Jesus Christ Himself. And I am certain that all I can do is kind of scratch the surface of this. But I want to bring out five points, briefly, that I think can help us as we try to engage with God's help to stand against the wiles of the devil. Most of my points will focus on swordplay. Swordplay. Because that's what we see Jesus doing here in this. And that'll make a little more sense in a second. But before we go further, I want to read from Ephesians chapter 6, where Paul presents to us the weapons of spiritual warfare. And again, I'm not going to go and explain all of these. But I want us to have this in our mind as we think about what we see from Jesus. So here in Ephesians 6 verse 10, Paul says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. That's the day Satan attacks. And having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And you can see why I say most of what I'm going to talk about is sword play because the sword of the Spirit is the only offensive portion of the weaponry I've read about. I think prayer is also counted in that in verse 18. But to this point, the sword of the Spirit is the offensive weapon, and that is the Word of God. And we see that on display here in Jesus. But the first point I want to make that is so clear from that passage in Ephesians 6, the first point of spiritual warfare is that we have to be willing to stand. Amen. If we went back through those first few verses in Ephesians 6, we would see the words, be strong, put on the whole armor, stand, wrestle, take the armor, withstand, stand. These are words of intention and effort. And I've said it multiple times times recently, we have to expect a fight. Amen. Amen. We have to expect a fight. We can't go into this with this foolish, prideful self-confidence, thinking we've got this, this isn't going to be that hard, I have good intentions, I've got good people around me, I know the Word of God. My friends, this is going to be hard. He's going to come at us when we're weak. He's going to come at us when we're tired. He's going to come at us when we're angry. He's going to come at us when we don't feel good. He's going to come at us when we're surprised by something. He's going to come at us when we're under the burden of a trial. He's going to come. And it's going to be hard. I went to Walmart last night with Mary. It was kind of late. Not super late, but I've been working all day trying to finish up Anna's uh, bathroom, painting, Lights, plumbing, all this stuff. I was tired. And I went to Walmart, you know, and I, I just uh, pushing the cart and doing all the stuff, you know, and just kind of, I'm kind of in, in the zone, you know, and let's get the yogurt and get the different stuff. And then it came, I was like, well, I wanted to get some, get some of my soda, you know. It's one of those 24 packs. And it's like, I go over and I pick it up, and it's like, this is heavy. And I'm like, and put it in the cart. I'm just like, what is the easiest way to get this in the cart? And it's like, just pick it up and put it in there. Quit being a wimp. You know, you ever get in one of those modes where you're just kind of like, you know, you're just like, ugh. And it's like, I can do this. 
I mean, it's just, it's just a 24-pack of Coke. I'm not that weak, but you just kind of sometimes get just, you know what I mean? You just don't want to. And sometimes we go about our spiritual life like that, and that's exactly when Satan's going to come. You know, and it's time to say, you know, I just got to muscle up here and put it in the cart and I'm going to have to put it in the car and I'm going to have to carry it in the house and I'm going to have to unpack it and just realize that's what it's going to be. Do it. Do it. And I know it's kind of a silly example, but that's really what it comes down to a lot of times spiritually with us, right? Because, you know, it... it when, when, when the need arises to, to stand against something and to do the right thing, it's going to come at the most inopportune times. Maybe it's a conversation you need to have with your spouse to resolve something and you just laid down in bed and you're tired. I see all of you are very wisely not saying amen. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. But we have to recognize we shouldn't let ourselves be caught unaware by these things. And we have to be willing to stand. We have to be willing to fight because it's worth it. Number two, we see from Jesus in all of these, but I'm just going to kind of go through one at a time. This first one, he was tempted to turn the stones to bread. And what did Jesus do? He responded with the written word of God. You have to know God's word if you're going to stand. You have to know God's word if you're going to stand. Psalm 119, 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Because what happens to me if I don't have light on a path? I go off the path, I trip, and I fall. I do not make good forward progress. I need light. How significant was Jesus' knowledge of the, world, of the word in that moment? Consider what was at stake. What was at stake when Jesus Christ was being tested, tempted, tried? All of our eternal destinies was at stake, right? That's what was at stake. I thank the Lord that He knew the Word. What's at stake in your life? What's at stake in your life when you're being tested, tempted, tried. Psalm 119 verse 11, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. I think that's a scriptural argument for not just knowing where to find it, but internalizing it. Whether you can memorize it word for word and book chapter verse, or you spend enough time in it that you have a really clear sense of it. Having a firearm is no use when your house is burglarized unless it is at hand. Doesn't do you any good if it's in the other room. You want to keep it close at hand for when the need arises. And my friend, Satan's not always going to choose to fight you when you have a Bible and a concordance nearby. You need it in your heart. 2 Peter 1.5 says, Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. We talked about that verse a bit recently, about that virtue being a spiritual energy, a good intention to move forward. Adding that to your saving faith, you want to go on with an intent to follow after God. And that leads you then toward knowledge, which is supposed to go on then. But we've got to know what God says. And Jesus knew His Father's Word. Point number three. The second temptation listed by Matthew here was taking Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple and quoting Scripture to Jesus. He quoted Scripture to Jesus. Satan knows the Word of God. Very familiar with it. Has it memorized better than we do. And Jesus, in this moment had to recognize that Satan was misapplying Scripture, trying to trick him. You see, it's not enough to know the Word. You need to develop and deepen an understanding of the Word. That's point three. You need to seek to understand it. Because, my friends, anybody can quote Bible verses. Anybody can quote Bible verses. 
We have Bible verses quoted to us by unbelievers to try to tell us that what we're doing is wrong. Or isn't Jesus about this? There's been quite a bit of testimony about that, hasn't there? You know? Well, isn't Jesus love? God is love. They'll quote Bible verses at you. What about judge not? What's it mean? Because what happens when someone quotes a Bible verse to us, a Christian? Do we just go, oh, I didn't know that was in there. <laughs> I mean, you know it's there. What does it mean? You see, Jesus recognized this. Hebrews 5, 13 through 14 says, For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil, to recognize the difference. Unskillful means inexperienced inexperienced. I remember when I was uh, going through school, I worked in the summers, um, had some different experiences, but one was to work on the shop floor uh, running a grinder um, at, the, um, at uh, the aircraft engine plant uh, that I eventually would work in um, as, a, as an engineer, but I was there running the grinder. And I heard time after time uh, the folks down there on the floor complaining about the stupid engineers who would design all these things and had all this theoretical knowledge, but when it came down to it, it couldn't be made the way they said it should be made because they didn't really understand how it worked. They didn't understand what was involved in making it and putting it together. And so when I finally became an engineer, one of the things that I tried to do is to get, develop a relationship with the people on the floor and talk through the thoughts and the designs to understand because they knew they were the ones making the parts. They were the ones help putting it together. Will this really work? You may have a great idea, but if you can't make it, if you can't produce it efficiently, it won't matter. You see, there had to be another level beyond just the theoretical understanding to an application point, to really understanding. This morning's message about the Lord's Supper was intended in part to prevent deadly misunderstandings. Right? People not coming to take the Lord's Supper because they think, I'm not worthy. That's not good. That's not spiritually healthy. People thinking, oh, I've, I've messed up how I've taken the Lord's Supper and therefore I've lost my salvation. That's not what the passage says. And we need to understand it's worth diving into these things because our spiritual health and welfare is at stake. I thank the Lord that Jesus didn't just know the Word, He understood the Word and recognized good from evil. Point number four, we've got to embrace the Word. This is a really important point. In this third Temptation. Jesus has offered the kingdoms of the world and his response is, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. I want you to notice Jesus' singleness of devotion to the Father in this temptation and in all of these prior to this. He didn't just know what to say. He didn't just know what was right. He didn't just understand what was right versus what was wrong. Jesus believed it. It was in his heart to follow the Father, to trust Him, to do what He wanted because He had this true desire and devotion to the Lord. If you think about it, let's go back for just a moment, back to Ephesians 6, where Paul lists the weapons of our warfare. And we talked about the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. But let's go back up to the beginning. What's, what's the belt in verse 14? The belt, what's, what's girding your loins? That's talking about a belt. It's truth. The breastplate of righteousness is truth applied and lived. 
feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace is, is the message of the gospel, the word of God. The shield of faith, faith in what? Faith in what God has said, God's word. What about the helmet of salvation? Paul describes it to the Thessalonians as the helmet of the hope of salvation. I believe that's the belief and trusting in the promises of God. That there's a purpose to the trial, there's a purpose to the pain, and one day it will pass. We have hope because we believe the promises. You see, truth is... God's word is not just woven into the, it's not just the offensive weapon, it's woven into the very things that protect us from the blows of Satan. Because this truth is not just something we hold apart from ourselves as a knowledge, it's got to be in our heart. It's got to be in our heart. Bible verses are not magical charms or spells that ward off Satan. It must be in your heart. Amen. You can't cross-stitch enough Bible verses and hang them up in your house to keep the devil out. That's not how it works. But when it's really in our heart, when it's really in our heart, my friends, that is the power of the word. Convictions are beliefs that have been forged and tested in the fire of affliction. That's what a conviction is. Jesus Christ had convictions about His Father, who He was, what He meant to Him, what He needed to do, and that He would not just know what the Father said and understand it, but that He would obey it that he would obey it because he trusted his father. He loved his father. What is all knowledge without love? It's nothing, right? Paul said it. You can know everything. You could, you could understand all the mysteries, but if you don't have love, it's nothing. And so there must be at the core to this a love for and embrace of the word because of the one who spoke the word. Finally, we've talked about standing, we've talked about knowing the word, understanding the word, and embracing the word. This last verse here, verse 11, actually back to verse 10, Jesus said, get thee hence, Satan. This is over. Get out of here. For... Then he quoted that scripture. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. One of the final lessons we see here from Jesus about spiritual warfare is keep hope alive. Keep hope alive. Jesus was not left to die when this trial, test, temptation ended. His father loved him. His father loved him. And in this circumstance sent angels to minister to him. One of these pieces of the armor we just spoke about is the helmet of the hope of salvation. And that's one of the things that we need when we are going through trial. And as I look out here tonight, I know there's a lot of folks, probably every one of us in some way, that are going through some level of some sort of trial. And one thing that we need to endure this in a way that pleases God is to wear that helmet of the hope of salvation. This is believing the promises that God has a purpose for this. We don't have to know why. All of those answers dissolve when we think about who He is and what He's done, what He's told us about Himself. All of those questions can dissolve into the person of Christ that He's a good God, He's a loving God, He's a God that's in control of everything. He's a God who knows what He's doing. And He's never going to die. He's never going to end. He's going to keep every one of His promises. And if your child, He loves you, He loves you, He loves you, and He means it for your good. Amen. Amen. 
that, believing that and trusting that, is adorning yourself with the helmet of the hope of salvation. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and we've been looking at this verse a bit lately in different contexts, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. And an important thing to get from that is you face trials, so is everybody else. Right. Don't let Satan trick you into thinking your trials is worse than anybody else has ever faced. My friend, he's trying to isolate you. Don't let yourself get isolated. Everybody's got pain. Everybody's got things that, that hurt, right? There's no point in comparing it. Hurt is hurt. Loss is loss, and we have it in different degrees and different flavors, but there's pain. If we go on this journey of, of, of faith, there's going to be pain. There's going to be loss. There's going to be struggle. What you're facing is just like what everybody else faces. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Jesus stood faithfully against the fiercest of attacks under incredibly difficult circumstances. And when it was done, as James said, he submitted himself to God. He resisted the devil. And when it was done, he said, get out of here, Satan. Get out of here. There's nothing for you here. You ain't got no part of this. And he left. And the Lord sent angels to minister to Jesus in the wilderness because I think he was too weak to make it out. And the Lord came to him in that circumstance in his extremity and gave him exactly what he needed. There's more that no doubt we could draw out of this. But there I think are five really important points about spiritual warfare that we learn from the Master himself. When he faced the adversary and stood, he stood. He wrestled. He withstood. He was adorned with the full armor of God. He withstood until the end and he triumphed over the devil. And may his stand move us and inspire us to equip ourselves so that we may in that evil day stand as well. Let's have a song tonight, brother. Appreciate you all being here. Stand and sing.